Okay. Having seen this sort of panoramic view of why evil, Satan's fall, which as far as the historicity of it generated the pattern of evil having seen what God's design philosophy is and Satan's um, objection to it namely God says truth be free and Satan says truth be shaved we have the setup for understanding why it plays the way it does in our lives. The panorama is this is an argument that's going on for, you know, maybe billions of years. And we're it's playing out in us with the climactic trial argument being made by Christ himself about why truth be free is first of all ultimate solution apart from which there really is none secondly ultimate love which was Satan's you know hidden contention you might say it wasn't really hidden in heaven but it's hidden to us and thirdly, why it, it actually makes good on the problem that made him sin in the first place, which is a sense of inferiority. So those trial arguments at their root get answered at the cross itself. And Satan's gotten the answer already. So it's like, well, why is this going on still? Well, it's going on still because of two things. Number one, in the middle of a trial, God brings up, a, a, God the Son, brings up a whole new body of evidence that didn't yet exist. In the middle of the trial, namely Matthew sixteen eighteen. I will build my church. He prayed for God the Father to determine how many or who that would be in John 17, 20 through 23. So one reason why time is still going on after it is that Christ prayed for there to be a church and Father agreed and so the church has to be completed. The other reason is that although Satan was defeated by the cross, his arguments were all defeated by the cross, what he had in his favor was that Israel had rejected Christ. So he lost one and he wins one. In other words, he lost the point about his arguments, but he won the point about, well, see, time should have stopped. Because all the promises were made to Israel, but they were all contingent on her accepting Messiah when he came. And when he came, she said no. So, he loses on the root idea of the trial, but he wins on technicality, doesn't he? So, the problem is, is that the promises to Israel still have to play. This new church entity, on, be, you know, in addition, this new church entity being grafted in, as Paul talks about it in Romans 11, um, it's designed to, to bridge back to Israel, which is what Romans 11 says. And, as it were, inaugurate the 
body of the new covenant, which is the theme of the book of Ephesians. In other words, the head of the new covenant is already in heaven. But the body of the new covenant that the head, um, and you know, authorized, invented, and paid for on the cross, well, that body isn't finished yet. You know, Vashti refused to come, and now Esther is being built, and of course anybody who is Jew or Gentile gets to be in the new Esther, which brings about a new covenant relationship of its own as body to Christ but also will just like Esther did justify the bringing in of Israel to the to the new covenant promise turned Jeremiah 31 on her own in the millennium you know started up by the trip so in a way you have to kind of call this a mop-up operation but on the other hand, it provides more answers to Satan about why, yes, a loving God invents truth be free and why truth be shaved is actually not at all a desirable answer under any circumstances. That it would be better to suffer a cross than to shave the truth. So, the spiritual life that Christ had that enabled him to endure the cross is now the same spiritual life we get. That also is the theme of the book of Hebrews, and specifically Hebrews 12. Of course, we all fall far short of that. But at the same time, it is the same type of spiritual life. You can super mature in it. And the goal is for all of us in aggregate to reflect him, to in aggregate be the spiritual maturation of Christ, which is Ephesians 4.13. We get there by being under our right pastors. That's Ephesians 4.16. In between, you can be children tossed to and fro by all the spiritual charlatans they're not spiritual of course only the spirit is spiritual um, that's Ephesians 4.14 and then Ephesians 4.15 is on well you know you can grow up instead and then Ephesians 4.16 here's how okay but the idea is that all body parts are being fit together that's 1 Corinthians 12 in order to suit the head, and by means of getting the head of Christ, that's 1 Corinthians 13. So it forms a kind of final answer to Satan. Because his second argument is basically how can a loving God send his creatures to the lake of fire? And by means of what we go through down here, we're each sort of witnesses for his side or God's, showing why it is love to let go. On the one hand, those of us who are to get to the you know, the final destination of spiritual life, which is to get to the maturity of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 13. Those of us who become spiritually mature, we're demonstrating God's love not because we get there, but because, I don't want to call this, Because of the kind of love that it is. Okay. The difference. See. Satan's whole. 
spiritual rest. Stumbles over this how much freedom when they're suffering question. Do you start to shave the freedom in order to reduce suffering? I mean, he's, his, soul, his sort of messianic platform is that the truth shouldn't be free to the extent that it increases suffering. Okay, a lot of liberals today would, un- would empathize with that. Of course, the problem with that argument is that all learning requires suffering. That's, if, that's Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. All learning requires suffering. So, in order to have no suffering, or pared down suffering, you suffer a loss of learning. Now, for those who don't want to learn in the first place, that argument sounds real good. But for those who do want to learn, that argument doesn't sound so good. I mean, frankly, the only reason to want to live is to learn. Learn means that the next moment is going to be something new. And even if it's a moment that has stuff that you already well know, the moment is new. You're learning the moment. And there's always some sort of reconfiguration. So by saying that, you know, truth should be shaved to the extent that it increases suffering, well, everything increases suffering. So you might as well just say, okay, but stop being alive now. Of course, that's Satan's secret dream. He wishes God would just obliterate him. That's what he was trying to tempt Christ to do in Matthew 4. Just kill me, okay, please, I can't stand living anymore. Yeah. Every moment for him is a suffering. He just wishes he would have never, never created Okay, and he'd like it very much if all that was true for the rest of us. Just destroy the whole universe and God and everything. Got a death wish. So, on the one hand, those of us who actually make it in the spiritual life demonstrate why truth be free is better because we end up getting to the place where we'd rather suffer because if that's what God wants, well fine and he wants it and he doesn't want it he wants it based on you know, the intrinsic value suffering births the role of suffering is to birth something birth learning birth some kind of result in other words, he, God said, God married birthing and suffering together. <coughs> so that the purpose of suffering is to birth. That's his purpose for it. You want to elect against his purpose and just suffer for no reason? Well, that's your problem. So it proves to Satan, this whole development of church, what Christ's suffering on the cross actually birthed. In other words... The cross itself proves that Satan was wrong to argue against truth be free on the grounds that God was not loving. That he would be more loving if he invented truth be shaved to reduce suffering. Because the maximum amount of suffering there can be is on the cross. It just There's no more left than that. He's, he's basically paying for the suffering of hell there. So it's bigger than hell. Having seen that answer, which still hadn't been played yet, was what that suffering birthed. Well, it births the kings, and the kings all reflect the same motive and mindset of Christ because Christ's head is built in their heads. And it's all playing live and it's all playing free because God won't shave the truth. 
So everybody who's maturing in Christ thinking, which is to say learning and living on Bible, is a demonstration to Satan about what the cross is suffering birthed. When I say Satan, I mean to everybody. But not everybody understands the issue, and not every, you know, I mean, when it's playing down here in the human race, that same maturation is a demonstration to people. But they, they don't, they don't know the trial time, so they don't see it that way. But they do see something. Satan and company are seeing the trial times. And they're totally amazed at us. They hate us, they despise us, they admire us. And they're totally amazed. How can this Aki human actually reflect the mind of Jesus Christ? But we do. And we don't understand it either. Like Abraham, we had no idea. We have no idea how much we love God until he puts us to the test. He puts us to the test because we don't know. He knows. He can see it. We can't. Abraham did not know how much he loved God until he sacrificed Isaac. It was always a sticking point in the relationship. That Abraham had no son. It was the one thing he really wanted. Why, I don't know, but he did. Now, I suspect the reason he wanted it so much is that Christ prom that tries this God promised Abraham that Abraham would bear the, you know, Abraham's loins would, just, you know, descendants. One of his descendants would be the humanity of Christ. And that just made Abraham go absolutely wacko wanting to have a physical son. So that he could look at that son to see the son in the distance. Because it says about Abraham that he longed to see, Christ said about him that, Abraham longed to see his day. Alright? So that might explain why Abraham wanted a, a physical son so badly. And so God makes him wait for 25 years until he can't get it up anymore. And then finally grants him the wish. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. And then 20, between 20 and 40 years after that when Isaac is of marriageable age that's in um, well it's also in the book of Genesis obviously I want to say, it can't be 45 somewhere around Genesis 20 26 maybe 27 he takes Isaac you know God says kill Isaac he takes Isaac to the mountain, and then Hebrews 11 tells us he expected that God would restore the, the young man after he killed him. So he'd get him back from the dead. That demonstrated truth be free also. And it's the same story here is that God doesn't share the truth. Things happen to us. We don't say no. And that shows what the suffering births. Then there's the flip side. And I'll cover that in the next increment.